Good morning, everybody. It's good seeing y'all here today. Good morning to those online. We'll do our usual greet. Make sure you greet each other online and uh, uh, welcome everybody on this Sunday. Um, with that, uh, I want make sure you get your communion ready. We want to uh, make sure you guys have that. We'll do that later. Um, a little something about our online service. We know there's a little bit of uh, technical glitch this morning, but uh, Brandon got it worked out awesomely before service started. We're trying to go live on YouTube and on Facebook. So if you're not following us on YouTube, follow us on YouTube as well. We had it live on YouTube this morning, but we didn't have it on Facebook. So we had to kill that one and come back to the Facebook one. But we're trying to offer many different avenues to watch the live service. As we know, some people are actually not on Facebook, but most can, uh, you know, access YouTube. So we're we're constantly trying out new things, so if you're not following us on that, follow us on that. I do want to let you guys know the grief uh, session with Sally Singer um, is online on Zoom today at 4. If you have not signed up for that, if you want to be a part of that um, grief, uh, grief uh, session and, and, and things that Sally's doing, which would be awesome, um, uh, email, email Sally, contact Sally, and, and we'll get you hooked up with that. Um, I think that's about it for this morning. With that being said, let's go into worship with our call to worship. This is written by Joanna Herider. Hopefully, hopefully I said her last name correctly. And this is a responsive, so I'm going to read, um, see if it's in bold. It is. So in bold. So at home, you have to read the bold. So if you're here, you got to read the bold. Help me out here. We come to worship this morning from different places. We come to worship this morning for different reasons. We experience the presence of the Spirit in different ways. We hear Jesus' words with different ears. Deny yourselves. Take up your cross. Follow me. Amen. Thank you all for participating in that. We haven't done that in a long time. Uh, our prayer comes from John Vandelar, but it uh, has some Amanda Wagner Mead adaptions. Let's go to God in prayer. Long before the change of name, before the first signs of new life showed the beginnings of promises fulfilled, you asked Sarah to make her home among foreigners and share the blessing that was to come. And now, O oh God, you ask the same faith of us, the faith to count ourselves among the least, to find our place alongside the poor and broken, the faith to trust in your mercy and your promises and to share what we have received. The faith to wait expectantly for your reign of justice and equity together with those who most need its gifts. God, we pray that you will teach us to be children of Sarah, sharers of the blessings we enjoy, the blessing of plenty shared with those in need, the blessing of healing shared with those who are sick and wounded, the blessing of joy shared with those who celebrate 
and of tears shared with those who grieve, the blessing of friendship shared with those who are excluded, and of solidarity with those who fight injustice, the blessing of peace shared with those in conflict, and of confrontation shared with those who bring harm. And in some small way, may our faith and our sharing help to bring your promises into being in our world. We pray this alongside the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall, but you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battle's won, for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness, I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence, you never failed me yet. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence, you've never failed. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence, you've never I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. I'll see you do it again. Promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence, you never fail. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands.
So we come to our time of pastoral prayer. I do want to let you all know that we are participating in an activity with the, uh, the region invited any congregation that wanted to have another congregation as a prayer partner. And I signed us right up. <laughs> and so uh, for all of Lent, uh, we're invited to pray for New Light Christian Church in Indianapolis. Uh, they are actually a church start off of Light of the World Christian Church, which is also in Indianapolis. Uh, and their pastor is uh, Michael Scaife. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But they are also holding us in prayer and holding me in prayer. He and I have sent a couple emails back and forth uh, to lift up some ministries and things to, to pray for in particular. So we'll pray for them today. But I invite you to add them to your own uh, prayer list uh, to hold them up and lift them up because... Uh, we may worship in different places, but we all worship the same God, and we want to support and pray for each other. I also encourage you to send in any of your uh, prayer needs or celebrations. We have prayer praises that we send out. As much as we send out prayer concerns, you can contact the office by either calling or emailing and let us know so that we as a church family can hold you in prayer. So I know that God is with you wherever you are, and God is with us here, and God is always listening. So let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, we come to you humbly and hopefully as we continue our journey this Lent to Jerusalem, remembering your promise to be faithful to us and to the world. We know that we are not alone in this journey, and we want to lift up our Lenten prayer partners at New Light Christian Church in Indianapolis, and especially their pastor, Michael, and all those who worship and lead there. We pray that you pour out your spirit of power and strength, protection and of blessing upon them this season. May they offer your blessing to their community and to the world. We also offer our thanks and we're grateful to have their prayers for us during this time of journey and of promise and of change. As always, we offer our prayers for those suffering in our own church family those who are sick and those who are weary, those who are grieving and those who feel lost. We also offer our own celebration with those who have known healing this week and found light in the midst of darkness. We know that faith and doubt live so close to each other. We pray for leaders everywhere in all areas of life. We pray to give them courage and that you give them strength. You give them faith and you give them grace to use their power to heal and to lift up, to encourage and to challenge for the greater good. God, we know that you ask hard things of Abraham and Sarah today, and Jesus, you ask hard questions of Peter, just as you will ask us to follow you in faith, to pick up our own crosses in order to follow you. We know that it wasn't easy and it wasn't without sacrifice for them and it will be the same for us. So we pray this morning that you will give us the faith to both lose and to gain, to follow and to trust, that we are in fact walking towards new life found only in your son Jesus Christ in whose powerful and holy name we pray this day. Amen. So once again for our message today, the plan is to show a video. <laughs> and I'm getting a thumbs up, which means there's a very good chance that it's going to play. Uh, hopefully this is both uh, informative. Uh, I, I really like how it tells the whole story, a, a large part of the story of Abraham and Sarah. But they're also just fun. Sherry's here again. She's seen several of these. And we thought maybe this Lent we needed a little bit of that. So hopefully they make you smile. Hopefully they make you think. And then uh, we'll move on to our message for the day. Let's watch. Scriptures today as a part of the story. Genesis 17 with the first seven verses and then 15 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of multitude of nations. 
I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. And as I said last week, um, all the Old Testament passages have been paired with New Testament passages, and this one is from Matthew 16, starting in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? So today's story and all of our videos are the only one that include a woman in them. And if you read the scriptures closely, it's Sarah who God actually promises to bless, specifically. God says, I will bless her and she will give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. But as we saw today, up until this point in the story, none of this has seemed much like a blessing to Sarah. Her husband upends her life to move because God told him to do it, which first leads them to a land of famine. Then they finally reach a fertile land, and the Pharaoh is so enamored by Sarah's beauty that he wants her for his own wife. And Abram agrees in order to save his life. Then after being Pharaoh's wife and all that would entail, it's Abram who ends up with all the cattle and the animals and the resources and the servants. Then, as probably anyone would probably do, she grows impatient with this plan of God and literally laughs at the idea of being able to give birth at her age. She orders Abram to conceive with Hagar, who he then makes his second wife. But that still doesn't solve it and only leads to her own anger and frustration and grief and causes her to banish Hagar and Ishmael. At first glance, nothing about this looks like a blessing. But that's also what Peter thinks in the story later when Jesus starts talking openly about his own suffering. It's not what Peter expected. It certainly wasn't what he wanted in a Messiah. He wanted the Messiah to use the familiar, the old tools of power to change things, you know, like with swords and becoming a king and through armies and even traditional worship the way that Peter was used to it, which can be its own kind of of weapon. He thought, we just need to overpower the people who have overpowered us, and we just need to use their tools, and then we'll be victorious. There are not many spots in the Bible where you use an exclamation point, but Jesus does when responding to Peter. He shouts at Peter, saying, get behind me, Satan, because he so misunderstands what God is trying to do through Jesus. Jesus has to remind him, I'm not here to win. I'm here to save you from the very desires of power and control and your own comfort. And because that's what I'm here to do, it's going to require something radically different than what has come before. And like he does with Sarah, God wants to birth an impossibility. Something only God can do. Only God 
can make a 99-year-old woman give birth. Only God can transform a cross from a symbol of death and suffering into a symbol of life, and not just life, but eternal life. And Jesus says, if you want to witness this kind of transformation, if you want to witness these things, then we have to remember that there are two sides to the promise. One side is God's blessing and God's faithfulness, and the other end is our promise. Like Sarah and like Peter before us, our promise is of faithfulness. Our promise to follow. And it made me think about what's happening right here, right now, in this moment in history that we find ourselves. I feel that there are ways that God is trying to do the impossible here and now. I believe God is trying to help the church, both the big C church and the little church, which has relied on the same rituals and systems and buildings for hundreds of years, and saying this is an opportunity right now to birth something impossible. To birth an entirely new way of being church, one that may not be as dependent on Sunday morning worship in the ways that we always have. Learning about ways to be engaged and not just to attend. But like Sarah, we've been through a lot of struggles and a lot of strife and a lot of loss and a lot of grief this last year, and all we really want is normal. I only have a few people to say amen, but can we get an amen for that? That's what we want, right? But these stories remind me, as much as I want that too, that God wants so much more than that for us. God wants transformation. In every Lent, that's what we ask for on Ash Wednesday. Create in me a clean heart. Make me new, God. Transform me. And maybe this year has not brought many changes to your life, and that, God bless. Maybe it's just been an inconvenience or just a small shifting of things. Thank God. But for most of us, or many of us, It has been a generation changing, a seismic shift in how we work and teach and learn and worship, how we bank and gather and raise children and care for parents and celebrate and clean and how we grieve. It has also opened a Grand Canyon-sized opportunity to be different, to be transformed by it. I hope that our passages and our Forefathers and foremothers would say, please don't let this pass you by. Please don't miss this opportunity. But I also get from their reactions why we, want, why we don't want to, <laughs> why we don't want to grab onto it. Because you see that both Sarah and Peter, this is why we lo- I love these people in the Bible, because they have the most human reactions to this, right? First off, Sarah and Abraham both laugh at this idea because it's impossible. It's impossible that God can do this. And then, once she's done laughing, she gets impatient and tries to finagle the blessing her own way, right? Getting Hagar involved, which only leads not to blessing, but to anger and ultimately to some abuse of Hagar and Ishmael. But it's the idea that we can't make it happen, but we can have faith that God will make it happen, will transform us, will offer this blessing we couldn't have imagined. It made me think about every time I've ever tried to make something happen at church. (laughs) I have a long list of failures that anyone can see. I can encourage, and I can suggest, and I can buy the book or explain the practice, but it's not about me. Sometimes you just have to wait, like Sarah, for the moment, for the opportunity And the blessing didn't come in the time that Sarah might have chosen. She might have chosen decades earlier for this to have happened, for it to have happened in her homeland, maybe closer to her family. And it certainly wasn't the way she would have imagined it. But God was faithful, and the promise was fulfilled. The blessing was given. A generation was begun 
And Sarah was so changed by it, it changed her even unto her name. She was unrecognizable from the person she was before. God made her a mother of nations, of the two religious families of Judaism and Christianity, and even made Hagar the mother of the third, which is Islam, proof that God can even make a blessing when we get impatient. And it reminds me that we are given the opportunity all the time to birth new things in our own lives. In the church, it can be new ministries, new ways of being, new kinds of worship, but we can also birth new ideas of what family can be, just whole new ways of thinking. Chad talks all the time about the new kinds of thinking he's gotten from seminary, how it's opened his eyes, new ways for us to be tolerant, to be open that we can birth a generation of people who go to the church who know that the true purpose of the church has very little to do sometimes with just the building. If there's ever a generation of people that know that, it's us. And that's hard to swallow because we spent a long time paying off this building. We're very close, and it's exciting. But we've also learned this year that it's just one of the many, many tools we have to spread the gospel. And we want it to inhibit, to encourage that, never to inhibit it. That we don't want it to keep us from going out there where Jesus may be calling us. But like Peter, sometimes we just don't want to believe it. We just want to go back. But like all these stories, God is always calling us forward. God says, into a land I have already prepared for you, one of milk and honey. But in order to do that, there are things you will have to leave behind, like Abraham and Sarah, things that Peter had to leave behind, let go of old ways and pick up this new way to follow me. As he says to Peter, you must lose your life, your old life, but you will trade it to get to witness this new one in Christ that I have for you. I think it's just very hard for us to understand how Peter would have heard the words, pick up your cross, because it's been so transformed for us. All the things that that would have suggested he had to let go of, the old ways where disciples were honored along with their rabbis, where rabbis got special treatment and his students would benefit as well, where he would heal and teach and be seen in certain ways in the community. He thought he'd be able to follow Jesus all the way to the temple and into the government and watch him topple it in the old ways. But Jesus says, as he does and will continue to all through Lent to us, I'm going to do this in a radically, entirely different way. And he says to Peter, I hope you will follow. So the good news is we know how the story ends. We know what choice Peter makes that he does follow despite it being drastically different than what he had expected and just like Sarah it changes his even unto his name and his whole life and then he becomes the legacy of generation after generation after generation that is who Jesus builds his church upon these choices that Peter makes to pick up his cross and to follow and that legacy has blessed the whole world On our journey to Jerusalem again, promise, God promises to be faithful. God promises us a blessing, but also understands the sacrifice that goes along with that. Jesus asks us what he asks us every year and what he asks Peter, what are you willing to lose in your life in order to gain all that there is to gain in the abundant life we can know with Christ. I come to communion. Man, it gave us a lot to think about in that sermon. That's uh, what I love the video. The video was awesome. Um, I relate to Abraham. I don't really have a great plan of where I want to go and how I want to get to places. So I, 
I count on a lot of people around me to help me with that, right, Joe? Joe, Joe's our navigator on mission trips, so thank God. Who knows where we would end up? Uh, But as we think about, um, as we re-enter church uh, life uh, after pandemic, as we regather for worship, as we we, we think about the new ways in which uh, we do church, in which we engage in our faith, and all the tools that we have around us. We've been preparing for this for quite some time, and I think the pandemic year is really just pushing us into this um, kind of new world. Uh, you know, when, when we will need each other around us to help us to navigate, navigate this new world, um, to navigate uh, and figure out where we're going, how we're getting there, to hold on to the values that are important, the traditions that are important, but not to hold so tightly that we don't pick up the cross, that we don't reach the people that need to be reached. There are so many out there um, that need to hear the gospel, that need to hear the good news, and our focus should be, if you would ask me, solely on on reaching people. And so as we enter this this new time, let us reflect on that. Let us reflect on, uh, on, on people we need around us to do the important work uh, of following Jesus each and every day as a church. Let us pray. Dearest God, we are gathered at this table to be in covenant with you. We are called to follow you in faith and trust. As we break this bread and pour this wine, let us be reminded that Christ's body was broken for us as a sign of your faithfulness. Your love is poured out for us like the blood of Christ was poured out, so that the covenant might be sealed, and so that we might be yours. For all the ways your love reaches out to us, touches us, welcomes us, we respond with thanksgiving. Amen. Be- before I break this bread, I got to add, who made the bread? Who made the bread? Do we know? Uh, is this? It's banana bread. <laughs> oh, man. I, can we just go back to like Meyer, like the loaf? Because I'm trying to do low carbs and the body of Christ is going to get eight today after, after we do communion. So uh, thank you to those that bake this. It makes it special. Um, I, I look forward to it. It makes, makes this moment even, even extra special. So that day, that, that night that Jesus taught his disciples, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you took the cup and he poured out the wine and he said this is my blood shed for you for the remission of sins as long as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup you do this in remembrance of me We come to offering today. We are taking up a special offering uh, for Week of Compassion. Um, if you got a Lent to Go bag, there was some information in your Lent to Go about Week of Compassion and different um, op- things that they do and opportunities. 
But one of the things they do is they show up when disaster strikes and they help out people in, uh, in need. And obviously we know with Texas recently with the storms and the ice and the cold weather, there's going to be some need. I'm sure that Week in Compassion will be stepping into and helping out. I know uh, I have friends in the Disciples Church who serve churches in those areas, so I know there is a need, and we do have our brothers and sisters from our dominate, denomination in those areas. So um, any uh, offering above and beyond what you usually can, can do is, uh, is always appreciated. Um, but check out Week of Compassion and see what they do. Uh, with that being said, let us give of our tithes and offerings. Your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So Just a couple of announcements before our blessing today. Uh, the Red Cross is having their blood drive today, and Shelly said there are at least a couple of spots still open. So if you want to give her a call uh, and see if you can get in to give the gift of life, I encourage that. Uh, just a reiteration of what Chad said, the grief group does start today. They're doing Dan Mosley's book, um, Lo uh, Love, Lose, and Live. Um, and we have copies here, but just get a hold of Sally Singer, and you can join that on Zoom. And last but certainly not least, as we said, the church are, is the people. And one of the ways that we remember that is uh, we invite you to send in your smiles. Uh, we love the pictures before worship. We miss seeing you. 
Uh, you get to see us, but we miss getting to see you. So if you haven't sent in a picture yet, please do that. Um, but uh, I loved that the video described them as uh, the ordinary, uh, because Peter was also ordinary. Sarah and Abraham were ordinary. What helped them to be extraordinary was their acts of faith. Um, that people of faith who feel the most ordinary can be called and are able to do the extraordinary on behalf of God and on Jesus. We are those people. We have that faith. Know that, believe that, and take that with you this week. Amen.